So we could theoretically legislate all cattle farmers had to feed their cattle seaweed, and then we wouldn't have to worry about how many hamburgers we were eating. Mm -hmm. And I just think the impact of that kind of policy change so towers over anything that you and I can do in our individual lives that while it's, it would be better if you and I behaved better, and I'm, as I say, in the same boat as you are, it's so much more important for us to be mobilizing and pushing for political change because change of the scale that we need is only possible at the policy level. It just simply isn't possible for individuals to make that kind of difference. On that note then, how do we find ourselves now and how do you think we are now with Donald Trump in the White House, who's made his position on climate change more than explicitly clear. We have, I think, in Europe, a level of political division that is echoes what's going on in the US. And currently, I think it's fair to say we are too distracted with other things to be really concerning ourselves with the climate problem. In countries like Brazil, one of the great ascendant economies, the ones with so much left to protect now has elected a politician who likewise uh, wants to avoid climate change. This is a depressing time if you have the conviction that politics is the solution to this problem? Well, I think the most distressing news is really what I consider the failure of the Paris Accords. Um, you know, just a few years ago, we had a truly international, um, you know, cooperative system established that would um, push all of the nations of the world to act aggressively on climate. No major industrialized nation is on track to meet their commitments under the Paris Accords. And even if they did, we would still be in store for over three degrees of warming, which mm -hmm. is well beyond what all the scientists call the catastrophic level of warming. So on that level, things are really bad. And as you say, global politics does not seem at present to be moving in a direction that makes that kind of cooperation more possible. It seems less possible going forward. That's really distressing. Um, but when I look individually at the nations that we're talking about, I see a lot of signs for hope. I, in the US, just in the last three years, the number of people who believe that global warming is happening and the people who are concerned about global warming has jumped, tw each of those categories has jumped 20% in just three years. Um, the number of people who are really concerned about global warming has jumped 8% just since March. So there is real movement on all of these points. And I think actually that last category is the most important one. It's not people who believe in warming, it's people who are really worried about it. I think there have been, for decades now, a large slice of the population who is concerned about it, but really at the bottom of their list of political priorities. And I think the more we stare straight in the face of this problem, we realize not only is it immediately pressing in a kind of existential sense, but it also governs everything else that we care about politically. If we're worried about economic inequality, within nations, but also between nations, if we're worried about conflict, we're worried about even domestic violence, gender equality. All of these things have the footprint, the fingerprint of climate in them. Mm -hmm. And if we're really worried about addressing them directly, we also have to worry about addressing them through addressing climate change. I see movements like Extinction Rebellion, the Climate Strike Movement. I see a lot of really exciting grassroots, grassroots movement on climate across the world. I find that really exciting. I think that the pressure on our policymakers is growing. In the US, the Democratic Party, which until recently was nominally um, worried about climate change but had not put forward any meaningful legislation to address it, is now very much behind as a party this Green New Deal proposal, yeah. which embraces the goals that the UN put forward in October to have our carbon emissions by 2030. In fact, they want to beat that. They want to do. They want to get to zero emissions by 2030, which I think is basically impossible. But the fact that that is, one of the, that is the stated goal of one of the two major parties in the U.S. is major, major progress. It's still too slow. I think that things are not moving fast This is fast what I was going to say. I mean, we're <laughs> looking at what I, what I can sort of see looking at my kids and, and looking at the concerns of younger people today. Within a generation, we will have a population of people who really are concerned about this issue. Yeah. The point that I could see real political progress. But what you're telling us in this book is we don't have a generation to think about this problem. You know, we should have started... 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but we didn't. I mean, among other reasons, it would have been a lot easier to, to make the changes we needed yeah. if we started back then. But I think um, when we talk about geopolitics, the other factor that's really important is um, this is not an issue that is really, this is not a crisis that has been produced primarily by countries like the UK and the US and the rest of the EU. Um, those nations are responsible for the lion's share of historical emissions. Yeah. But if we think that we've gone from a basically stable climate to a crisis climate in 25 years, that is almost entirely the result of the industrialization of the developing world, and in particular, China. Mm -hmm. um, China is now responsible for a quarter of all global emissions. And I think we'll be determining the lion's share of our planet's future in the coming decades. So exactly how Xi Jinping acts on climate, how much he sticks to his new 
rhetorical commitments about green energy and a renewable future, a responsible future, and how much he continues to open new coal plants, what kind of climate standards he holds, the infrastructure projects that China is building across Africa and the Middle East too. These are all hugely important questions, probably more important than the internal politics of nations like the, e the US and the EU. And that's a little distressing as people in the nations that we're living in because ultimately our, con our power is limited. Um, but I also think that you know China is sees itself as coming into power as a, a new empire. I don't think they want to preside over a burned world. I think they want to preside over a prosperous world so they can, um, they can profit from it. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine that over the next decade or two, they will take much more aggressive action even than they're committed to now. And I'm thinking personally in the aftermath of the sort of collapse of the Paris Accords, that what we're likely to see as a solution is something that's put forward by a few leading wealthy nations rather than um, a truly global network of cooperation. So, for instance, a bilateral cooperative agreement between the, U the U.S. and China, um, perhaps investing in, in negative emissions technology, which mm -hmm. is the one sort of, it's a little bit of a moonshot. We have some of these technologies that we've tested at small scale. We don't know how they work at large scale. But if we really want to stabilize the climate, it's something the like, thing we need to. It, really it is the to, it is the thing we need. I, I think yeah. um, there is no way that we get below two degrees with conventional decarbonization. That is just replacing dirty energy with clean energy. Yeah. According to the IPCC, they ran 400 scenarios that got us below two degrees. 344 of them featured negative emissions. They later ran 116 scenarios. 108 of them featured negative emissions. And the ones that don't feature those negative emissions, it's such a precipitous drop that it almost can't be produced. So by when policy. you say negative emissions here, you're, you're basically saying the only way we can meet that target set down at Paris now is to take carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere that's already there. Yeah, exactly. And that's... Um, and that was really, that was almost unthinkable a decade ago. People saying, God, we hope it never comes to that because we yeah. don't really know how to do that bit. We're barely figuring out how to do it now, yeah. but we're, now, we're now in a position where we're dependent right. on it coming. I've got one final question for you. I think one of the big problems politically, we're talking about the importance of politics, about getting collective sort of change when it comes to how we behave as a, as a species. The traditional politics sort of puts environmentalism very firmly in the left-wing camp. It's about collective responsibility, it's about sharing of the commons, acting in the interests of others. We see that clearly writ large in US politics, it's, it's, very, it's very similar here in the mm -hmm. UK. What would you say to someone who is proudly right-wing, interested in their personal responsibility, who shuns the ideas of environmentalism, because basically because of its politics. I think there's a lot comes down to it. How would you speak to that person to communicate to them what you're warning of in this book, and it's something that they can be enticed to doing something about? Well, I would say two big things. The first is that there is no escaping this. If it unfolds as we expect it to, there will be no life on Earth that is untouched, and in fact, no aspect of life that will be untouched. This is the, one of the major themes of my book, is not just the science of warming and what it, you know, what it will do to us, but what it will mean to the way that we live, so it will affect our storytelling, our culture, our relationship to technology and, and um, history and all that stuff. There's no, you, living far from the coastline or slightly in the northern latitudes or being wealthy will not be a protection against the ravages of warming, so everyone's in this together. That's one thing. But the more pointed point I would make is that the research emerging from um, economics recently on what climate change will do to our um, societies is not just incredibly dramatic and horrifying, but it's a true reversal of what was the economic conventional wisdom as recently as a few years ago, which was that aggressive action on climate was going to be costly. Mm -hmm. It would mean foregoing some degree of economic growth. And for those people on the right who are really primarily oriented around that value, that meant putting off the problem longer, waiting for more growth and more technology to emerge to make the action cheaper. But in fact, the new research says very, very strongly that faster action on climate will bring economic rewards in the very short term. One big study said that just by 2030, fast action on climate could bring $26 trillion of economic benefit to the global economy by 2030. 
That's not very far away. That's an enormous amount of money. And if we don't do anything on climate, we could end up at the end of the century suffering economic impacts totaling above $600 trillion, mm -hmm. which is more than twice all the wealth that exists in the world today. Um, and we could have a global GDP that was 30% lower than it would be otherwise. That's an impact that's twice as deep as the Great Recession, and it would be permanent. So if you're oriented around the values of economic growth and prosperity, as I think many of on the right are, the, the logic there is very, very strong, and it's shifted that, in that direction very quickly. Faster action on climate is better for economic growth, not worse. I think that's a huge bit of news from the research. I think it hasn't yet filtered into the minds of our policymakers, and in particular those policymakers on the right. But I think over the next few years it will, and that's when we'll really start to see our politics shift. Fantastic. Um, well, it's been fantastic talking to you a little bit. I can't say it's been the most cheerful discussion <laughs> I've ever had, but a really worth, uh, important one and, and thought-provoking. Uh, David Wallace Wells, author of Unhabitable Earth, published next week uh, here in the UK. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me.